a Muscatating First Nation in Saskatchewan. That's my roots. But I grew up as a Métis and I'm from the Métis Nation. Um, there's Aboriginal uh, definitions are First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. And for some reason, a lot of us have uh, both. Because, and it's been because of, I don't know if you've ever heard of script application and those type of things. It's when they, you got the land when you're a Métis. And then uh, you got ripped off of that land and ripped off of that script. And you ended up being uh, uh, the forgotten person, really, in Canada. But the way my roots come about is uh, being First Nation, being born a First Nation, going to a, uh, a hospital. What happened at the hospital is they kicked my mom out of there. So I was actually born on the highway because of that, because they didn't allow Indians at the, at the hospital at the time. So that, that's the kind of uh, beginning that I had with regards to growing up, getting involved in the union movement, uh, uh, only because I was cheesed off, those type of things, and uh, moving into these areas. And these areas that I moved into, I just want to say this is the, I'm more or less going to be talking about CUPE because CUPE is uh, near and dear to me. I've been in it for over 30 years. I've been involved actively in it for about 25 years. So uh, I know quite a bit of what's going on. I don't know much about this system, though. So I didn't even <laughs> give it a shot. Uh, what are unions doing in their engagement with Aboriginal people? Well, I want to start, uh, i got to tell you a bit about QP. We're the biggest union uh, outside of the private sector, right? Uh, biggest public union in Canada. We have over 600,000 members, and our members include university workers uh, and faculties. We also have uh, municipalities, uh, education, healthcare, um, grade schools, high schools. We have bands and councils organized now, uh, friendship centers, uh, making nations, local. So uh, we're quite diverse with regards to where we're headed. I want to uh, start a video, but I'm going to see what I get to well, well, The video I want to show is actually from our uh, sister union, uh, Public Service Alliance of Canada. And it, sh it actually shows what they produce now actually shows why we got involved in um, the Aboriginal effort here. So I do want to show it. I don't know, hopefully, I think we only have one screen going. So. But this is the type of uh, statistics we were throwing around 20 years ago, 25 years ago. This is the reasons why our union started to get involved into the Aboriginal movement. That's because of the statistics that were floating around. Uh, one of them starts talks about life expectancy. I'm also in a union. We call ourselves the Canadian Staff Union, uh, although I, I represent two members. But I asked them to. Uh, get me into my pension plan 10 years le less because my life expectancy is 10 years less. So. <laughs> um, let's see, we know that, that the other reasons we, where we get, we're getting involved is there's sort of shortages out there. We know that. Uh, the Electricity Sector Council has come to us to help get qualified people, not only Aboriginal, but qualified people uh, to run into their energy, right? Because we represent also 60,000 energy workers across Canada. So those are the type of things. There's many shortages and many fields out there. When I'm going to show you how this uh, connects to the strategies that we, that we have going. Um, some of them are organizing. First and foremost, right? how do you get QP to get involved in an Aboriginal issue? And because out there are First Nation, Métis, Inuit businesses starting up. We have many uh, uh, bands and councils out there, uh, 600 by the way. So there's quite a few uh, uh, places that we can uh, go and look about organizing. And this is one of the selling features also on how to get a union involved in, is to expand their base, expand their membership, expand their dues, right? So they make more money also. So that's how it, it, part of the cell was also. Uh, we also knew organizing. 
organizing in our communities was different because we've been booting up, booted off reserves, right, trying to organize. They always thought we'd come in with government cars and they were scared of talking to us. And we've actually been booted off reserves. They've sent letters to us saying, you're not allowed back on the reserve unless you get permission to ban the councils. So those are the type of things that we have to uh, do. Organizing turned differently. We organized the workshop, uh, workplace of 600 people, 94% uh, of them Aboriginal. And of, of those, when we had them just about organized, they went back and they had to talk to their elders. And this is before we were putting in for the vote. So we had to respect that process and, uh, and uh, look at different ways to handle this, add that part into our organizing strategy and to organize, which we never did before. So there's a few things that we had to do differently. Other things, uh, community potlucks. Not just hosting Aboriginal members, but hosting the whole community to a feast. Those type of things. We switched the way we do organizing in our, in our union. And one of the reserves even suggested that we put to vote for joining a union to put the vote to the community where the whole community had to vote on whether the union would be there. Because I, I don't know, if you know much about reserves, there's turnovers on reserve by election. And those turnovers always happen family by family, right? So, but everybody at some point in time may be related to a banding council member. So that's how that vote by the reserve happened. Uh, we have many alliances, not only the Aboriginal communities, but like I said, we have uh, with the uh, Electricity Sector Council of Canada, we're on a lot of these councils, a lot of these sectors, because we represent so many members, right? Uh, uh, we're part of the university sector. Let's see, we have the AFN, the Métis Nation, we've had the uh, uh, partnerships with them. We've moved projects ahead with them. We had a project just the other, this year that we it cost us about $25,000 to produce a video. And it's a video of how communities work together, and the communities being the union and the Aboriginal community. And we traveled up the South Saskatchewan River. And uh, that's on YouTube, by the way. You can check it out. River of Unity. Uh, but what it does show is the how, we, how we can bring two communities together. And that was really the, the full uh, message. We also produce booklets for the Métis Nation. Uh, we've, we've helped with, there's a place in Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, called the Safe Drinking Water Foundation. They pro, they've developed a process for safe drinking water that doesn't use any chemicals. So we're helping to fund the Safe Drinking Water Foundation so that we can move it on to the reserves that are lacking clean, potable water. Uh, the employment equity represented the workforce. Really, uh, a lot of backlash, but I want to talk a bit more about it later on, okay? The structural change that, that we're going to talk about, I'll talk about some other structural changes we made in our union, but there's others out there. All our unions have memberships. They all have locals. They all have provincial bodies and national bodies. What we've been doing across Canada uh, in, our, in our units has been producing designated seats onto these, uh, onto these bodies, right? Decision-making bodies is what they are. But when you say about a designated seat, the first thing that comes to your mind is, well, how could you get away with doing that? You can't get away with doing it. Everything's democratic in the union. you got to have votes on it. So if you were a local and I want to put a designated seat, I have to put a motion in to get that designated seat. You all have to vote on it. So uh, it's our job is to sell that. How do you get a local to put a designated seat? The designated seat for an Aboriginal person on the executive. So that's the democratic process that we use. So whenever you hear of a designated seat, especially in a union, it's not like we just went and deemed it and that's it, right? No, all our membership has to vote on it. So that's what we mean by designated seat. The others, uh, and this goes about all over, because you get an Aboriginal on one of those seats, 
Uh, most times not, everything else moves into that area, right? Uh, all of a sudden, when you talk about immigration, you're talking about uh, an Aboriginal issue within immigration. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of controversy out there and uh, in the Aboriginal community. I was just talking about bottled water. We have a bottle, QP bottled water campaign. And <laughs> I wonder why I drink bottled water. Well, in our reserves, in the, mostly in the northern part, and not, I shouldn't say just mostly in the north, some, in some other areas, that's the only thing we depend on to drink. I've been to Yellow Coast, Saskatchewan, which is central Canada, and turned the tap and turned up brown water, right? So those are, so when the CUPE comes up with the campaign, because we represent all municipal workers, municipal workers, water workers, uh, uh, sewer workers, what we do, the they campaign against privatization. Privatization is the bottled water. So they campaign against it. So we have some controversies in our union. Um, but you'll see that, <laughs> I was going to say, you'll see that Indians more or less do, right? But uh, I know that we're moving towards First Nations. I've always called myself an Indian because that's the community I came from. And I know that a lot of First Nation people believe Indian is a racist uh, uh, title because it was delivered by the government of Canada, right, the Constitution. Uh, other structural changes in our union, we have elders, elders involved in meetings, the important meetings. We have elders even in collective agreements, elders that come to a disciplinary hearing. So we'll have an elder that has, a member has the ability to call on an elder to take a disciplinary hearing. And actually, they have really helped to the point where we have a lot of non-averagers using the elder. So, um, to smooth things out. Because a lot of our grievances end up to be attitude between uh, member and uh, boss. Um, the other thing we have, uh, gender. Gender for us is important because when you come from a traditional background, uh, women uh, were uh, uh, made a lot of decisions. They were shared decisions. And the other was youth. We have a lot of youth. We got youth committees, youth uh, uh, national youth councils. So our structures have really changed and developed into inclusiveness, let's say, for Aboriginal decision making. Lobbying government for change? Jeez, I don't know how many times I've been, but we refer to as on the hill, right? Because on the hill is where all, all the lobbying for the federal government takes place, and that's in Ottawa, and uh, mostly every Aboriginal organization, I shouldn't say mostly, they all are. All the Aboriginal organizations, national organizations, are all based in Ottawa, and they're all based in Ottawa because that's the uh, the federal government area. And Aboriginals are jurisdictionally run by federal uh, government, except when it comes to money, you'll see that. There's always fights between province and, and the feds with regards to helping Aboriginal people. We also work with an organization called Defenders of the Land. And what they do is they're, they're a cross-Canada organization of Indigenous people. And uh, they come up with a bunch of programs, educational protests, and we're involved in most of them. We fund them. Uh, we're active in them. Uh, we move them along. In some, case, in some areas, we host them. We're the host uh, organization. Uh, when you talk about advertising, so this, I'm just showing you some of the stuff we're involved in, and I'm trying to show it to you quickly because I only got like four minutes left. Um, advertising in Aboriginal news goods. Uh, before we never did that, 20 years ago, you look in an Aboriginal newspaper, there is no union advertising. Now pick up an ad Aboriginal newspaper or a magazine, you'll see a union advertisement in just about every one that you look at. So that, that's the change that's happened over time. International solidarity. When I talk about international solidarity, what that is to me is the global justice. Global justice of indigenous cultures across the world. And we're thickly involved in this. Um, 
we work on uh, trade about trade agreements, climate change, and uh, extreme poverty, right, to the ind indigenous communities around the world. And I can just uh, give you a few things of it. Like in Pakistan, with regards to the floods, we contributed fifty thousand bucks to the Red Cross, right? Uh, the Haiti earthquake. Uh, with other two other unions, we contributed over a hundred thousand dollars. So we participate in everything. It seems in everywhere: Cancun, Mexico, Gaza, Middle East, uh, Vienna, England, Africa, Turkey. Wherever there, we see there's problems, we get involved in, and that's our international club. Now, the reason why uh, we talk with regards to international, when I talk indigenous, because they're indigenous communities across the world, and when we try to re relate the struggle, let's say. And you'll see that, because we fight for UN declarations, right? The UN declaration for indi indigenous people. And, uh, wow, I only started. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so those are the type of the areas that we get. The projects when I talk about Bella Bella, this is a real project that's ongoing right now. We've taken a, uh, uh, a literacy program that we had for only union members and we've expanded it to include the Aboriginal community. So now we have the Aboriginal community taking the literacy program. Uh, and skill development. Skill development could mean anything from GED, uh, driver's license, those type of things. Because we find those communities lacking. In our own workplaces, it's lacking. So that's what we're doing with Bella Bella. When I talk about the water project, the water project for us is that same project, now that it's been successful in BC, we're applying it, but also we're including the ability for qualification for water operators, so certification for water operators. And the reason why we're doing that is because QP has water operators all across Canada that can assist in getting people qualified. So that's a, that's where we're moving to with the water. Two uh, projects that we're going to try out this year, not this year, next year. We got what's called the essential skills and needs assessment. And man, there's so many of those going on that uh, I couldn't even tell you how many. I started to count them, but I know for sure there's, uh, to be really safe and guaranteed, there's over 10 projects going on in the essential skills, which is pretty pretty close match to uh, the Bella Bella, right? Let's see, Aboriginal awareness, uh, one nice thing, well, I shouldn't say nice, nice thing to me. Anyhow, we put it in a collective agreement, the Aboriginal awareness, but we made it mandatory for everybody. But before we agree on with the employer that's mandatory for our union members, we made sure it was mandatory for all management. <laughs> and we got that deal. So uh, we really enjoy that one. Uh, everybody has to take Aboriginal awareness. It's a three hour course. And uh, even our union members who scream and shout to get to it, it has a 98% rate after that everybody enjoyed it. So we do have the, that assessment going. When we work with other unions, part of it is, of course, PSAC, the video I just showed you. We work with the CLC, which is the Canadian Labor Congress, which is the largest umbrella group of unions, all the unions are to. We work with them. When I talk about the collective agreement language, that's exactly what I just said. Put Aboriginal awareness in there, you put it, whatever goes in our collective agreement, we police, right? So we have teeth to it. So if the employer doesn't uh, do anything about what we both agreed on, then we can actually take it to a grievance and try to win it there. So that's the thing about a collective agreement. I know you hear a lot about, oh, unions will negotiate. Well, we don't negotiate, we only negotiate. We can't force an employer to give us a wage force an employer to give us anything. Uh, yeah, we have a strike in our back pocket, but man, the year where, uh, I've been a, a negotiator for 15 years. It's tough to go on strike, and I know that. So, uh, so yeah, it's easy to say that, oh, you're gonna go on strike. 
but it's another thing to actually do it and get people, like a room full of people, to start saying, yeah, let's do it, right? So it's pretty tough doing that. Campaigns, oh man, we got a million campaigns going. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the, uh, let me show you. The campaigns, Jordan's principle. Jordan's principle, remember I was saying about the federal and the provincial dropping it out? Well, there was this young fella in the reserve. He needed treatment, and uh, the only way he could get treated is moved off the reserve. And the problem was moving them. The parents couldn't do it. They couldn't afford it. The province didn't have the money, but they wouldn't do it. The feds who had the money wouldn't do it. They fought over who was going to send them. For two years, that little fella died on the reserve with no medical attention, and he couldn't get it. So that's what Jordan's principle. Leave the fight aside, fix the kids, and then uh, you guys can scrap it out after that. But the feds are the ones that are responsible in most cases because they're the ones that put in the Union Act and they're the ones that got the resources for what they, what was given up. The other one, uh, obviously, violence against women. You hear about it all the time because I think that they've just taught somebody that uh, have uh, killed three Aboriginal women on the Highway of Tears. Just happened this week or last week. So yeah, and we're always on the on the forefront of fighting the violence against women. We have National Aboriginal Day. We want to actually make it a national holiday. It's been on the books now since uh, September of 2007. So uh, we're hoping at some point in time to uh, get that as a national holiday, but we'll keep working on it. International Day for the world, uh, World's Indigenous People, of course, Indigenous. We always look at you know, the Indigenous rights across the world. Right now, uh, 370 million people in the world are threatened with extinction and assimilation, so it's, it's quite a bit, uh, and it's a big flop. Anti-poverty. We know that a good job is the best anti-poverty strategy. And I want to dwell more on that when I talk about the representative workforce strategy that we got involved in. Um, Leonard Pelshe, yeah, you must have heard he's in uh, the U.S. and he, they won't let him come back. And we tried to, and the government won't try to extradite him back even though there's a lot of uh, uh, people that have said, no, he didn't do it, even the ones who had accused him. So. The uh, First Nation Child and Welfare, you heard it, about inequitable dollars. If you're on reserve and you have an organization for child care uh, to help people with regards to fostering and stuff, if that, you get less money if you're located on reserve than the, than the provincial governments who uh, look after child care. And that not only that, but Aboriginal organizations off a of reserve, like in the Regina, uh, get less money to help foster, that foster kids than, it, than uh, the provincial body does. It's weird the way they've done that. It's very inequitable. Uh, Shannon's dream, she's passed away now, but her dream was to get a school on her reserve and because it's been an ongoing fight there. Leonard Zachary, same thing is going to happen to this young chap that happened to Leonard Palshay 35 years ago. Leonard Palshay has been in prison now for 35 years. <coughs> Leonard Zachary looks like they're going to extradite him to the states and he's going to end up with the same state problems. Although he was involved in drugs, he should get the fair shot in Canada with the Canadian system and that's what we're, what we're fighting for. Not to say he's guilty or innocent, but to have the fight in Canada. But don't send them to the States. AIDS, HIV, one of our hugest files. Last uh, conference I was at, there was one to three Aboriginals a day uh, that were getting uh, AIDS, HIV. So it's, it's turned into one of our largest files. Uh, some of the winds, Ellison Aquifer, that was where the uh, water was threatened with a dump site. And it would affect a lot more than the Aboriginal communities. Uh, 
or when there was a wind. Bear or Lake right now, they, there's a mining uh, going on up there. And uh, they just put a moratorium on it for two years. But it's just a breath of relief, right? Because we just paid, I think it was $6,000 a legal bill for that one. And uh, uh, once that comes back, it's, that's like $60,000 a year it'll cost in legal. To try to fight a mine that shouldn't be there and try to fight the provincial and federal government in that area. The UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. <laughs> Yeah, if you remember, Canada didn't endorse this. There's a big uh, uh, protest campaigns against them. They finally endorsed it, I think, last year. But they endorsed the watered-down version of the declaration. And although it looks the same, if you actually delve into it a bit more, you'll find it's not the same one. Uh, Micmac Nation on trail. This is a jurisdictional issue. We have an Indian guy who whose tribe actually ended up between the borders. That was their land. But then when the Canadian government came in, they cut that border, right, with the, with the provincial line. And now he was hunting on the one side of his reserve, and that side of the uh, provincial government charged him for hunting on his own land. <coughs> Uh, court challenge program, again, uh, this is the Conservatives who deleted this program. It's kind of similar to legal aid, but it was set up in 1994 to provide assistance for important court cases to advance equality rights. So think about that. They, they killed off the court uh, challenge program so that people couldn't use it uh, to fight equality rights. Yet they have all their systems set up, right? Other projects, uh, ensuring meaningful Aboriginal content in the curriculum of high school. This isn't ours, by the way. This is a uh, secondary school teachers federation have just started this project. I remember when I was in school, and in social studies is where Indians always came up, right? I used to cringe in my, in my seat and think, oh, what bad news are we going to hear about me today? <laughs> this was great. Six, seven, eight, right? So yeah. Uh, I sure appreciate something like this coming up. And Aboriginal enhancement agreements, those are the ones that we have. We have many of those going on. They're great programs for getting people qualified. Uh, Canadian cost. Uh, we talk about employment factors. Uh, when we talk about Indigenous communities, health conditions. I tell you, telling these statistics in a union environment, it actually it benefits in getting people uh, to assist us in improving the lives of Aboriginal people. Now, isn't that the sad? They say, you say some poor statistic to elicit more money. That's just a, but that's the way it goes. It's borne by everybody, right? Enormous savings. And I'll show you what those savings are. Here's what it costs for providing remedial services. The Saskatchewan, 4.1. 31 billion in Ontario. So you get rid of this uh, social problem and you come up with 2,900 bucks per household. So how do we do that, right? The other thing, if you close the gap, gross domestic product. By 2017, we're gaining 160 million bucks. So we'd be looking good if we spent more money on our social problem. <coughs> And we're getting worse, by the way, that 78th ranking. Uh, before, about, I think it comes out every two or three years, uh, the uh, statistic. And last time we were uh, 63rd place. Now we're 78, if we had our statistics. And again, they talked about that big difference. Okay, a representative workforce. This is a program that we actually did and we're still working on Okay, They're represented at all levels. Kind of a dream thing there, right? In workplaces, in unions, management. Okay, there's two focuses there. Prepare the workplaces and preparing the people. 
And when we talk about preparing the people, it's actually going to the Indian community and saying, uh, look, start training the people because we know how many uh, LPNs are going to be gone in the next 20 years. So start training LPNs because we know you can do it. So this way, we got trained people that can fill qualified jobs. So that's what the represent, re representative support for strategy has been. And it was developed by Aboriginal people. I know that uh, I got a body now we're, when we talk about doing this. This is this is this big thing that was done by Indians. So then we could uh, have Aboriginal people uh, compete on an equal basis. That they have the training, the skills, the everything to move into these. Uh, good paying jobs, let's say, right? We can overcome a lot of barriers, and, and I say a lot of barriers, including our own unions, right? Time, resources, funding, so education and murder. So the partnership agreement is a component of the representative workforce. What the partnership agreement does, what you try to do is get a partnership somebody because it doesn't bind you to anything all it binds you is to talk about things talk about the Indian issues what this is and that's what you what it binds you to that doesn't mean you have to agree on anything no resources no finances nothing but you it does agree it does bind you to talk about what the problem is so that's why we we always try to go for a partnership This is the goals of that, right? The hiring is based on uh, qualifications. When I started my job, there's supernumerary programs, there's designated positions. There's a thing called super seniority, where I could have got 20 years extra seniority than everybody else, because uh, if uh, they were letting go of people, I'd have more seniority than them. So this, and this was a very, very big problem, because it caused a backlash. If you were working side by side with me, and I was giving 20 more years than you, I think that uh, you'd have a problem with me, right? So that's the kind of backlash it creates. So yeah, there were just, these partnerships are just agreements in principle. Uh, collective bargaining, let's say, this, this is the easiest thing to sign, a partnership. Because I did bargaining, and collective bargaining, and if you haven't been in there where 20 of you face 20, uh, employer representatives with you know eight of them being lawyers it's a uh, it's a tough because you're fighting over words like me or then or shell or like it's, it's really a tough uh, slugging with a partnership it's in positive it's with the community involved in it so it's really a nice uh, amicable let's say environment that is compared to collective bargaining stuff Tripartite partnerships, uh, we got the government involved in this one. This was the first of its kind, it was the model. The Aboriginal awareness training. And the goal of that was to train everybody, all the employers, right? But here's a workplace of 37,000 people, right? That's how many people were involved in this. 37,000 people. Now. We started out with training people. Uh, how many times can five people go out and train somebody? So we had to come up with a new strategy to train trainers, right? Because everybody's getting burnt out there saying the same thing over and over every day for you know, twice a day actually. So the train the trainer thing just happened as a part of the program that week. Okay, we need to do more thinking about this. Uh, yeah, the communicating the opportunities to the Aboriginal community. It's a great process because once you're out there telling them what you need, then they start preparing their educational, their institutions with regards to what, what they need for training loans. Yeah, I got, I got to get to the, um, the successes because Doing all this, uh, delivering the Aboriginal culture awareness, the continuous. Uh, so here's what happened. Here's some of the successes that we had. And 
And they, they were pretty amazing. 2,400 new hours on Iris since uh, 2003 when we signed the partnership. Went from 1% in the, in the workforce to 6%. Well, 29,000 existing workers, 10,000 of them being paper members out of 12,000 have been trained. I mean, in one area alone, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, it went from a representation of 0% to 20% Aboriginal. So those are the type of successes we had. The retainment. Once a person got into the workforce, it was trying to keep them there, right? And there, and for Aboriginal people, the rate was, uh, what was it? 96%, a turnover of 96%. Because they didn't feel wanted there. They didn't feel that they wanted to be there. Now it's a, uh, uh, what? No, it went from 4% retaining them to 96%. So a complete 100% turnaround. Three of the five regions, the team first uh, people's representative figures. Representative figures is what's in the community with regards to Aboriginal, what should be in your workplace. Myths and misconceptions, we have many uh, things on them. That's what I was talking about, about LPNs. We need them 20 years, so they train 20 years. For five years now, and that's been, every one of them been hired in the KP workplace. Uh, in addition, there was specific skills training. 500 people who's gone through this program. It's a 16-week program. And what they, what people take this program on is people that are on welfare. Those are uh, people who are in EI. So they take this program, they start the workplace, and they go move up the ladder. Partnering with the community. We have some testimonials. There were, you know, with regards to that testimonials is that we've had these workers come out and talk at uh, conferences and those, but they've gone on from, like, in this particular case, social assistance, abusive relationship, depending on welfare, to moving on and going up the career and going on to getting their own house now, their own car. So, and this is what we say about the savings. Now she's off welfare. Now she's paying taxes. Those type of, and we can have, we have hundreds of these people out of So that's why I say, how do you improve, right? Statistics wise, uh, monetary wise, everything. I, I wanted to talk about structural change, and we did uh, change our structure in the union. Right now, what we have right now is what's called the National Aboriginal Council. We've got councils in our regions now, Aboriginal councils. So we've changed the structure. Not only the person where I said at the beginning, the designated seats, now we actually have uh, executives sitting uh, on, on councils. And they make the decisions for the other part of the executive. So those are the structural changes that we've gone through. Uh, is there more work? Oh well, yeah, there's a lot more work. Uh, I just wanted to say one more story here. For my program, I run about two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, for my program, uh, and do we get the bang for our buck? Uh, I like to believe we do. We let over sixty six hundred thousand individuals and their family know about awareness. We also improve wages through the initiatives of by involving and hiring of first peoples. Our structures ensure more money is if is funneled towards first peoples issues such as 20,000 recently to the United Way in Alberta for the safe lake when they got evicted. Uh, and uh, not evicted, but because of fire. And the 20,000 uh, for flooding in Saskatchewan. Now the reason I put cost here is I have to admit some of the failures go back to why I got involved in 1979. And when they talked about employment equity, they said, oh, we're doing great. We have all this money committed to it. Well, they committed money, but it was administrative money. And every year for five years, they, de they developed a poster. And that poster showed, you know, that they're an employment equity provider and such. And that used to really chase me on. Uh, because that's where all the money went, the nice poster every once in a while. So that's it. And you know what? I, I can tell you this. Some of our own unions today are doing that same thing. They've got some administrative money and they're developing posters. 
Now, it's our, we talk to a lot of them at the CLC, and we'll be talking to them even more. But we want to see action when it talks about uh, uh, Aboriginal and moving the, that file along. So, so uh, thanks, but I didn't get to a lot that I knew about other unions, right? But, um, I, I do know a lot of what other unions are doing. I just know more with regards to you. Thank you.